thank everybody for joining this morning. Um, Ron Dawson and I have known each other for what, 25, 30 years. Um, yeah. And uh, we go back to the old Toshiba days and, um, you know, time moves on pretty quick, I guess, the older we get. Um, but anyway, uh, Ron's with Copa Data. Um, he has a, uh, a lot of experience in a lot of different things, um, you know, with SCADA control. And I thought it'd be really good to, um, you know, in introduce what he does. Um, and a lot of you probably know that I, I run this group called the Nikola Tesla's Collaborations. And my, my belief that, you know, growth of our world and society um, would have went a lot further if, you know, Tesla's information got out quicker, quicker. but also it's, a, it's a, the idea of sharing information so we get it out, you know, to people because, you know, there's a lot of different information that we all know. And the more that we, you know, share and, uh, you know, gain information together, we, um, and we all grow. Um, uh, I do um, very heavily, you know, believe in all the efforts. Um, there's a little video that I'll ultimately send you about, you know, Tesla, if you don't know who he, I mean, most people do, but a lot of people think of the Tesla car, um, but Nikola Tesla is kind of the, the genius behind it all. Um, uh, so at the end, um, what you can do is if you have any questions or you want to, you know, a copy of the video, um, you can send me an, an email at just roger at drivehotline.com and I'll be glad to send you a, a, you know, a copy to a Zoom or not a Zoom, but a, um, I'll download it to YouTube or something and you'll be able to get a, you know, a copy of the video if you want to you know, review what it was. Um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and open it up for, uh, you know, Ron to speak and I'll stop my sharing and let you go forward, Ron. Yeah, let me see if I can figure out. Oh, here we go. Share screen. And screen. And move that. Okay, so hopefully we're all looking at uh, or blue. There's always an easier way uh, motto. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. Okay, cool. Yes. And... Uh, yeah, so uh, yes, I'm Ron Dawson. I work for uh, for Copa Data for about a year. Um, before Copa Data, I started out in uh, 1991. Got my engineering degree from uh, the University of Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. Uh, two weeks after I got out of college, I found myself on an oil drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico, doing uh, measurement wall drilling, and. Uh, some pretty cool stuff going on with that and uh did that for just under a year and the price of oil dropped and they let us all go so uh then i uh, went to work for toshiba there in houston still and uh was in the plc and uh variable frequency drive application engineering groups so um you know, did a lot with either teaching PLC programming, uh, you know, helping people make various PLC projects. In the variable frequency drive group, I did a lot with the uh, communication interfaces. So, you know, you know BACnet, Modbus, AV Remote IO, Profibus, Modbus Plus, uh, you know, various communication networks with the drives. Um, then I left Texas, uh, moved to KEP to, in New Jersey, and I uh, worked at KEP for 20 years. So uh, that got me into HMI software, which in my thinking, it's kind of the lightweight version of SCADA um, and graphical touchscreens, industrial PCs, flow computers. And uh, yeah, then uh, a year ago, I joined Copa Data, and uh, where we uh, make the Zenon software platform, you know, which includes SCADA, reporting, soft PLC, and, and other functionality. So my uh, idea for the presentation today is to kind of start with kind of an overview of industrial equipment, because I know a lot of, you know, Roger's experience and probably a lot of yours is with, uh, you know, motors and variable frequency drives. And uh, 
you know, those are becoming products now that can't really just exist on their own anymore. You know, they get tied into other control systems, you know, into the cloud, into the internet. Um, the, and then that kind of leads into the industry. Uh, industry 4.0 idea. Let, let me uh, let me see if I can mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh no, it's no problem. And you know, if anybody has questions, just feel free to to jump in. You know, uh, you know, I'm I can be pretty flexible. So uh, yeah, so industry 4.0. So the you yeah, know this is how. It, kind of looking at the path of where we went from, you know, standalone equipment, getting up to, uh, you get to modern network, cloud, you know, IoT type things. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about Copa data, and that'll then lead into our, the Zen and SCADA software and our reporting features and other related features that connect up with SCADA. And uh, then I'll show you the software. So that's kind of the plan, but uh, you know, I'm flexible if we need to diverge uh, from that. Uh, so, you know, looking at different equipment, the, and this is the old way of looking at things, right? Like you, you know, you make motors or you sell drives or you uh, program PLCs, you know, you provide SCADA software. Uh, you know, so kind of, you know, sensors, maybe your company makes pressure transducers or, uh, you know, so that's kind of the old way of looking at things, like looking at the world as pieces and, you know, these pieces of equipment, you know, they all have their cool features. They kind of exist independently. You know, they might connect to other equipment, you know, with an analog signal or, uh, a relay contact or dry contact, right? But that would, old school, that would kind of be the limit of connectivity between equipment. It would be, you know, a couple of analog or discrete uh, IO wire, you know, essentially a few wires connecting them. Um, and, you know, of course that's changing, right? So now uh, people demand that equipment hardware, software, all be interconnected um, and connected, you know, either to slightly higher or lower levels of equipment or straight to the cloud. You know, so at home, you might have a Nest thermostat, right? And, you know, that goes right to the cloud uh, where in a, a building, you might have thermostats throughout a building uh, that are connected over a backnet network, for example which then goes to, you know, a Johnson Controls or Siemens system, which operates dampers, uh, you know, chillers and, or, or heaters, uh, ventilation systems throughout the building. So, you know, variable frequency drives, you know, often are connected to PLCs, uh, sensors connect to PLCs, you know, it could be a, you know, anything, a proximity sensor, uh, you know, uh, temperature sensor, pressure. Uh, so a lot of that tends to connect to PLCs. Um, then, of course, PLCs connect to SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Software, uh, which would include Zen and, and uh, you know, a number of other products, too. Uh, SCADA software then connects to manufacturing execution system software, enterprise resource planning software. All of it connects to the cloud. You know, if you sell a compressor skid, uh, in the plant that it goes into or the facility goes into, it'll be connecting to a SCADA system, but you might independently uh, connect that compressor skid through a cell phone modem uh, or G, you know, GMS modem uh, to the cloud. So you can monitor uh, predictive maintenance, uh, you know, and alarming and things like that on your compressor skin. So all of this, um, it, it, you know, several years ago, all that looked like often kind of pointless activity, like uh, all this connectivity and 
it looked cool, but people weren't really sure why they were doing it sometimes. But as time goes on, more and more people are uh, extracting real value from all that connectivity, you know, with uh, either predictive maintenance, uh, energy efficiency, uh, of course, performance, uh, you know, of the overall, you know, system or building or, or city or factory. So uh, that kind of leads into this, uh, you know, industry 4.0 uh, idea. So, you know, you go back to the 1700s, you know, you've got a, a loom, you know, a, a mechanical miracle, right? And then uh, you get up into, a, you know, electrification, electric motors, you know, motors lead to variable frequency drives, uh, PLCs step in here in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, and then the kind of the big jump with all that being uh, networking, you know, first uh, a local network, you know, Ethernet, right? Uh, then, uh, or even RS-45, uh, but that of course expands to the internet, the cloud, you know, Amazon Web Services, Azure, and so on. Uh, and, yeah, any questions yet or comments? Okay, so, you know, and so this is stuff that, that we're all... All right, yeah, you, know, mentioned, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Azure and uh, <clears throat> Amazon. Sure. Uh, do you use both of them? Uh, well, built into Zenon, we've got an Azure process gateway. Uh, so we definitely connect up to Azure. Uh, myself, I'm not as familiar with connecting to AWS. Uh, we've probably got a way to do it. Uh, we have a built-in easy method to connect to Azure, though. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, we you know, have done some pretty uh, big systems with Azure connectivity. Uh, a lot of the time for, uh, you know, for kind of building management type stuff. You know, with, uh, yeah, I'm just asking easy. because, I mean, we use Modbus for pretty much most things in our mm -hmm. five stuff and, and we have our own cloud platform ourselves, but I was curious as to what your preferences were based on all your experience. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I'm sure we can do both. Uh, the, you know, and the news lately, right, has been the, uh, like the Microsoft Azure platform had won that Department of Defense contract to run the cloud for the U.S. military. You know, uh, that now is getting rebid apparently, and maybe Amazon will get it with their AWS platform. Uh, but yeah, that, yeah, that's a kind of a continual big topic. And uh, within Zenon, we've got our um, uh, service grid platform, which lets kind of the whole product become uh, an entirely cloud-enabled product, uh, you know, geared toward, I mean, it could be something like a you know, smart city type thing. It could be an equipment manufacturer sending equipment around the world, and all the equipment can connect back into our service grid. So yeah, that definitely is a big topic, you know, any of the, the cloud uh, services. And, and we've got experts at our headquarters in Austria that, you know, like we have a, a few people that are expert in Azure. There's probably a couple I haven't dealt with yet, expert in AWS. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that answered the question, but yeah, no, yeah. That, it, it answers the question. You know, I just also curious how you connect. You said if you ship something across the world and it connects back to your cloud, right? Mm -hmm, right. Does it make the connection or do you have to call it? Well, that all has to be uh, configured, you know, with, uh, it, and you could do it with our service grid. You could do it with, you could build your own cloud and use, uh, you know, one of our, our zero process gateway, for example, uh, we've got, um, it, you know, other uh, gateway and connectivity options for that. Even things like OPC, uh, ODBC, you know, some of that might connect into. All right, thank you. No, well, sure. So, um, yeah, so just some of the goals of the smart business idea, you know, time to market, uh, 
managing inventory assets, uh, controlling complex systems, and you know, of course, maximizing profit. Um, yeah, so here just looking at some of the, you know, the, the model of how things uh, connect up and such. Uh, you know, the idea of kind of a pyramid of software, you know, with, uh, you know, ERP at the top, but really it isn't, right? Because above ERP, now we have uh, a cloud type things. Um, and, you know, of course, regulating always the, uh, an ongoing goal is regulating uh, various processes. You know, if it's, uh, you know, a filling line, you know, can you go from 12,000 bottles an hour to 13,000 bottles per hour, right? How do you do that? Um, you know, of course, you'll be involved in the, you know, the PLC coding, the machinery, but even supply chain management's part of it. I mean, you got to have the empty bottles, right? You've got to have the shrink wrap, you know, to wrap the cases of bottles. They've got to be moved out to a truck and so on. Um, the... the you know, looking at value added chains, uh, this lot size one is kind of a, a, I think a cool idea. I did some work uh, a couple of years ago for a cosmetics company and they wanted to uh, make foundation that was matched to a woman's skin tone. So there's, so they have an Apple app, you hold it up to your face, it takes your picture and then you tell it you want one bottle of foundation, you put in your credit card number, and uh, that gets, well, that data gets sent to a facility where this machine has a, a bottle, uh, blends three or four different dyes with a little dispenser, fills the bottle, caps it, labels it, and puts it into a box for shipment. So, you know, lot size one. So, you know, you don't have, you don't necessarily have to make a thousand bottles of this color, switch over to a different color foundation, make another thousand. Uh, you can make things one at a time with no manual uh, setup and configuration, right? The, the uh, machinery is all smart, networked and connected and a recipe or uh, a batch uh, functions loaded, and one bottle of cosmetics gets made to the right color uh, with nobody touching it, nobody getting calipers out, calibrating, manually weighing. It just happens. And that kind of stuff's pretty cool. Uh, you know, tying into all that, of course, you know, security, um, you know, planning processes, lead times, material flow. Uh, you know, all the inventory has to be managed. So, you know, all these pieces have to fit together and, you know, software like Zenon is a big part of making that happen. Um, the one key thing is, you know, manufacture independent connectivity. Um, so with Zenon, we don't really care if you're using Siemens PLCs. Toshiba drives, you know, you know, Beldor motors, uh, it, it's fine. Uh, we, uh, I'm not sure about connecting to a motor, but uh, any, anything that's got a CPU in it, we can uh, uh, connect up to. You know, we support uh, roughly 300 or more uh, industrial communication networking methods. So, uh, and we'll look more at kind of a list of them later, but we, uh, within Zenon, we pretty much connect to nearly everything. And if we don't connect to something, we have, for example, OPC, which is a method of connecting to software such as Kept Server, for example, that also has a few hundred drivers. So, you know, you can definitely connect our software up by one method or another to pretty much anything. Um, You know, with Industry 4.0, the overall philosophy is to collect all the data. Uh, and then you, it's got to be uh, 
typically stored uh, up in the cloud uh, or in some kind of database. Um, and the data has to be useful to people. So maybe it's uh, making certain graphs, which we can do. So that would be kind of a reporting feature. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the data gets uploaded to an ERP system to automatically order maybe corn syrup, right? If it's a, a you know, soda bottling facility. Uh, well, soda in New Jersey, pop in Michigan, Coke in Texas, but, uh, <laughs> whichever, uh, whichever uh, flavor it is. So, you know, managing the inventory, getting what's needed in-house in time. So all that information and knowledge, you know, leads to, you know, to profitability, efficiency, energy efficiency. And so a big topic uh, over the past several years has been uh, Internet of Things. So the, uh, you know, and I've got some IoT things in the house. That, you know, I think most of us do. Uh, the key thing with these is they kind of all tend to connect to the cloud. So they're not necessarily talking so much to each other in a coordinated way, but at least, uh, you know, at least things are making it to the cloud. So you can be on vacation on the way home, log into your thermostat, you know, turn the air conditioning back up uh, or the heat, things like that. And, uh, you know, there's definitely a demand and value for, for IoT devices. You have the ring doorbell. I mean, if I go on a hike through a neighborhood at night, all over I see these little circular lights on the doorbells. And, you know, those are ring doorbells. Now, industrial Internet of Things is uh, pretty much IoT, but for our world for you know the industrial and process automation world um you know including you know factory equipment electrical uh, building you know hvac that kind of thing um and again geared toward uh you know smart technology collecting data you know automating connectivity uh some various levels of artificial intelligence. Uh, usually what people mean by AI in this kind of application is often an algorithm or a model, uh, you know, mathematical model. And uh, yeah, uh, so IOT, uh, IOT versus IIOT, uh, one of them's industrial, right? So IIOT is the industrial internet of things. Uh, and it has, in a lot of ways, higher standards than just IoT, you know, related to, to security, reliability, uh, uh, durability, right? I mean, it's got to be able to take, you know, temperatures and maybe uh, climate and things like that that are in the facility. The, you know, these things kind of lead up to the uh, smart city idea where you've got, um, you know, you've got buildings that are efficient. And we're seeing it now, right, where you have, uh, you know, if you have a power grid coming under strain due to heavy load, uh, you know, they're pretty much all the power providers in the U.S. now have ways to uh, reach out to their customers to try and shed some of the load. You know, maybe it's a, a box on your air conditioner that the power company can reach out and turn off your AC, uh, or you know similar things uh, in in buildings or, or factories or facilities. Um, so you know you're getting coordination between the power grid between say the power grid and your home air conditioner. You know they're linked. Um, you know water ties into this. Uh, you know, leaks, uh, you know, avoiding wasting water, uh, could be uh, wastewater, you know, pumping with a massive rainstorm, how do you pump it out? Uh, traffic, transportation. So, uh, you know, more and more linkages between all of these. 
And within factories, you're looking at uh, uh, you know, integrating smart technology into pretty much everything in the factory uh, with a kind of a continual goal being energy efficiency. Uh, you know, depending on your situation, that might be energy efficiency to save money. It could be energy efficiency to uh, be you know, better for the environment. You know, the two uh, go together. Uh, and then, of course, predictive maintenance. Uh, you know, don't wait for the motor to, for the bearings to just ignite because they're so hot. You know, if you have a temperature sensor on the bearings uh, or a vibration sensor, you know, use it. You know, if the motor is running hot, it's vibrating, uh, you know, take care of that before you have actual equipment failure. So it, with these technologies, Internet of Things, IOT, um, you know, the market's growing rapidly. Um, I have no idea where $771.72 billion comes from or, or how that got calculated, but uh, it's, it, it's definitely a big market. Uh, and a key thing is you almost, if your products don't support these things, uh, the price you can get for the product keeps dropping and the demand for the product will drop. So you, you know, those of us who are involved in making things, uh, you know, we have to keep adding these technologies uh, to our products or they won't sell without it. And, uh, yeah, then, of course, you run into issues with security, um, you know, encryption, right? Um, you know, we all see the news things with, like, the Colonial Pipeline and, you know, hacking, ransomware, you know, it's, uh, you know, pretty uh, important stuff, definitely. Um, and, of course, all leading to uh, increased uh, return on investment and profitability. So starting to think about, uh, you know, control systems uh, with, uh, for example, a building management system or uh, industrial line control, you know, in the factory. Uh, you know, this is kind of leading in now to more towards SCADA type stuff. So in a building management system, you might have multiple buildings. Then you start thinking about, well, okay, we have one main computer running the SCADA for the building, but maybe we need uh, HMIs, human machine interfaces throughout the building. You know, maybe somebody essentially like a thermostat wants to, you know, make one room warmer, colder, uh, drier, you know, whatever it could be. Uh, yeah, so then you typically need uh, HMI clients, they would typically be called, uh, throughout the building or throughout the factory, uh, you know, in order to for people to locally interact uh, with the control system. And and as you're putting together a control system, uh, yeah, this graphic just shows kind of some of the things that need to go through your head. Uh, like looking here under connectivity at drivers, uh, that's one in my career I've had lots of involvement. In. You know, people, you know, these companies make hardware, right? Like companies I've worked for, other companies. Uh, every company has the best communication network you can imagine. You know, you know, Rockwell with their, uh, you know, Ethernet IP or Control Logics Ethernet. They think that's the greatest thing. You know, you've got Siemens Ethernet. Uh, you know, Profibus, Profinet, you know, uh, energy protocols like DNP3, you've got Modbus, uh, either Modbus RTU, Modbus TCP IP. So there's hundreds of these uh, communication methods with equipment. So you need communication drivers to connect them. Uh, gateways are basically adapters from you know, protocol A to protocol B. Um, you know, thinking, you've got to think about your, uh, 
you know, performance figures? How are you going to measure success? Uh, energy management, you know, workflow. Uh, we see that a lot with like pharmaceutical. We've got a uh, you know, paper on glass feature, uh, you know, trying to avoid the, you know, the notebook, right? The people uh, sign off on something. Now you've got to track all this dumb paper, right? So paper on glass stored electronically. Uh, looking here at diagnosis, you know, you need to be able to, to trend, you know, plot a trend, see a graph uh, of what's happening, of a process, or a, uh, you know, look at production figures by hour, things like that. Uh, you've got to think about uh, your cloud storage, uh, you know, getting data up into the cloud. Um, you have to think about your clients and clients here will be clients for the SCADA software. So do you, is your client just a cell phone running, uh, you know, Safari or uh, Chrome or Firefox? Uh, you know, and we can do that with Zenon. That can be uh, an HMI client. You know, so you have people walking around your factory, turning pumps on and off with their phone or, Maybe not, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can definitely give people access to the system and, uh, yeah, and we fully support security, you know, user authentication, even through uh, uh, mobile devices. Um, you know, maintenance issues, uh, alarming. Of course, security is always a big issue up here on the top left. Uh, do you just use Zenim's built-in uh, you know, username and password system, do you, or do you tie into, uh, you know, the network and let Zenon get its security through uh, LDAP or Active Directory or something or Radius? Yes, you know, so we can do all that, and many SCADA softwares can, although I think we do a lot of those functions better than others. But, uh, you know, these are just kind of some things to think about as you're thinking about uh, how to put together a solution with, uh, you know, with a variety of equipment and software. Um, yeah, there's networking concerns. Uh, you see the word redundancy appearing here. Uh, so whether you use Zenon or other software, uh, can it be redundant? You know, can you have, oh, questions? I thought I heard someone jump in there. Okay, so uh, yeah, so thinking about redundancy, it, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, and we have uh, some pretty interesting settings for that, either uh, just to back up in secondary or we have uh, something called circular redundancy, which is pretty cool. Um, it, yeah, and then thinking about, uh, you know, like energy management, uh, you know, a substation. We sell a lot of our software for substations. Uh, data centers, uh, renewables, you know, you know, maybe photovo photovoltaic or wind farm, pump storage, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, COPA data with our Zenon software, we're uh, independent of any big manufacturer. So we're not linked in with Siemens, Schneider, Rockwall, Honeywell. Uh, so we connect to everybody's hardware. So we uh, don't have any agenda of, you know, pushing people to use uh, one company's variable frequency drives or, or a certain company's motors or sensors or vision systems. You know, we just, our goal is to connect to everything. Okay. His name is Jeff. And... Uh, Yeah, looking here on the right, uh, looking at what our Zen and software includes, our our base product is SCADA, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. But we're a lot more than that. Uh, like if, you're, if I'm trying to tell somebody in one word what our product is, I tell them, well, we're SCADA software. But we're definitely more. We do a lot with uh, IIoT, cloud integration. Uh, we've got a built-in soft PLC. So using Zenon, you can have full uh, PLC programming in our software. Uh, we've got ladder logic, you know, it's, it, yes, 
structured text SFC instruction list. So we support the full uh, IEC 611.31-3 uh, PLC programming. Uh, we've got a great uh, kind of two levels of reporting. We've got the, the basic reporting included with the product. Uh, then we have an advanced reporting module that uh, can do uh, a lot more. Um, you know, we've got security and encryption built into the product, database storage, redundancy, and more. Uh, so looking at where we sell Zenon, and really this is where, for a lot of us, this includes what we do too, all of us. Uh, you know, either we're working in an energy application, maybe food and beverage, automotive, pharmaceutical, and then somewhere here we show a category that says uh, general, I think. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if there are some things we didn't hit with these. But uh, these have been uh, success areas for Zenon. So uh, we sell a lot into power substations. So pretty high percentage of power substations uh, in the U.S. and I guess in the world have Zenon in them. Uh, for food and beverage, uh, you know, a, a lot of, uh, for example, filling machines run Zenon. Uh, you know, sometimes people don't even know. Uh, you know, like a, you know, somebody working in a Coca-Cola factory might not know that their Crohn's bottling machine is actually running our Zenon software. Um, you know, automotive, you know, we've done quite a bit with uh, automotive. Ones I've gotten calls on have been uh, paint you know, the paint operations in automotive factories. And uh, also a company that makes uh, welding robots. We've had some calls, uh, support calls for them. And, you know, over the past year and a half, pharmaceutical has been huge. Um, you know, a lot of our software goes into uh, machines that uh, fill vaccine vials, for example. And uh, yeah, I had a chance to do some support with one company on it, and they—it's uh, kind—it's of, more complicated than I thought it would be. They, you know, blow ozone into the bottle to to sterilize it. They you know, dispense the right amount of vaccine into the vial. You know, they have to cap it, serialize it. Uh, you know, do a vision inspection to make sure it's serialized, to record the serial number, to make sure it's capped. And uh, then it has to get packaged, uh, all while maintaining, you know, appropriate temperatures. So, uh, yeah, it can get pretty tricky on its own. So, with all these applications, some common things that keep popping up, you know, is, uh, for example, data acquisition. That's always big. You know, uh, storing every kind of data for whatever the, the process is. Um, you know, visualizing the data. Uh, you know, so having some, you know, some nice graphics to, to visualize it um, in an appropriate way. Uh, I remember, you know, 10 years ago or so, the goal was to make the graphics as cool looking as possible. Now the goal is, uh, keep things bland, but whatever is having an issue should, you know, become a brighter color, should move, you know, something to attract attention appropriately. Uh, reporting, of course, is huge. And, um, and then the uh, part of the software that lets you maintain the application, you know, the, uh, we call it the engineering studio. You know, that has to have the features uh, that people need to put the system together. Um, yeah, any uh, any questions so far? Or... Okay. Um... Hey, Ron. Mm -hmm. I do have a question that goes back um, a couple slides where you had the single line drawings. You showed the industrial uh, line point picture picking up the HMI sensors, and then below it, you showed the building automation system doing the same thing in the building. And next to each of those, you had kind of this uh, stack that looked like it was uh, a data collection point. Are those 
separate that yeah that one right there are those you know all the three cans stacked on top of each other are those separate data collection pieces of equipment or is that just depicting information running through that line i think each of those is uh showing that data is being archived uh at that location so you know so you might be uh storing some data locally you know for line one uh related to the equipment there uh, then in Zenon, we have a, a feature called uh, evacuating the data. So basically uh, pushes the data up to another system. Uh, if needed, we can pull it back, for example, to plot a trend. But uh, like in this kind of diagram, the data from line one would get pushed up to this the computer labeled industrial. Uh, you know, maybe from there it gets pushed up to... Uh, you know, to a system running the whole facility. And of course, from there, maybe up to the cloud. So it could go in kind of a linear fashion like that, or, you know, with cloud infrastructure now, the, you know, the computer on line one could just directly send data to the cloud. But probably the data would go, you know, up to a, a bigger, like a higher order system, uh, the amount of data will get reduced and then it will get put in the cloud. All right, so um, so going back to line one is the example, mm -hmm. uh, underneath the screen where it says line one, is, is that data then actually just running through there or is there like a, a collection point, even if it's just on a laptop where you could grab it there as well or does it just run, I, I'm just, trying to figure out, and maybe it doesn't even matter. Um, but I, I, I see what you mean. I mean, it, it's a piece of equipment. Yeah, I mean, it really could be both, right? I mean, it could be that this line one computer stores the data and then periodically uh, pushes that data up to that computer labeled industrial. Or, okay. or it could just be continually happening. Uh, you know, the, that computer labeled line one could be storing data locally. At the same time, that data could be getting stored in that in PC labeled industrial and at the same time getting stored in the one labeled uh, building management system in industrial. So it, you know, it- So pretty it, flexible. Yeah, you really can do it either way. And a lot of it might depend on you know, the uh, IT resources. Uh, for example, let's say it's a ship. Uh, the ship might not have good high-speed connectivity all the time. So maybe when the ship, uh, you know, comes in range of a cell phone network, maybe then some data gets uh, uploaded. Maybe a much more limited set gets, of data gets sent over the, uh, you know, the satellite uh, internet connection. Got yeah. it. So, so, yeah, okay, we... Thank you. Oh, sure, you're welcome. Yeah, I had a question on the same one. Sure. It's like line one, line two, you know, are all those part of uh, Copus products or are they different? You know, could one be Siemens or whatever and they all come up to the very top so that when you log in, are you logging in at the BMS industrial line and then you're, let's say, drilling down to what's going on over here in line one and what's going on. In other words, I'm just trying to figure out how that how that works and it's is this all xenon running on everything or is this all different ones well in an ideal world it would all be xenon right <laughs> but uh, uh of course the uh the, the nice thing with all these uh common uh, communication standards is it doesn't have to be i mean the like a uh, one standard that uh software like our you know like ours and our competitors all support is uh, OPC. So that's object linking and embedding for process control, but people just call it OPC. And there's OPC UA and OPC DA. The UA is uh, the newer standard. And then we support both. So, uh, you know, we could supply, you know, we could supply data to a competing SCADA system, you know, say a Wonderwear system, uh, we could send data to the Wonderware system over OPC. 
know, that's fine. Uh, we could grab data from Wonderware by OPC. So, yeah, that, that is a nice thing about this kind of software nowadays that the, um, you know, if the software manufacturers like Copa Data, if we choose to, which we do, uh, we can choose to be uh, open and make our data easy to get to for other uh, industrial software. So uh, another standard, you know, database standards are big, you know, ODBC or you know, SQL, and, and we support all those. So uh, yeah, to answer the question, they don't have to be all Zenon. It could be uh, mixtures of other software, which in a, in a real factory it is, right? Because you you might have a standard in your factory. Maybe your standard is, uh, you know, uh, inductive automation ignition. Uh, but then you buy filling machines to fill your bottles, and they all come with Zenon. So, uh, yeah, you've got to deal with that. And uh, at least from our end, we make it easy. So we make it easy to get data out of our product uh, or push data into our product from other software. So hopefully that uh, answered the question there. Uh, I have I have one question. Sure. Actually, uh, I am from uh, I am from Panasonic. So we are doing mm -hmm. this uh, IoT IoT in the uh, so so many industries. So uh, I want to ask you so that uh, some machines we have collected uh, in the system uh, as it is the real time real time monitoring. So every time uh, when we need any data to recall, so we have to go to the cloud or uh, we can uh, just uh, table, use any pen drive. Every yeah, we, time, we, uh, we need, we, every time Sorry, we need to access cloud. Well, you could. I mean, that's one way. We can store the data in the cloud. Uh, we can store it uh, within our software, within Zenon. Uh, we can store it in a CSV file, DBF. We can store it into a Microsoft SQL database. Uh, we can put the data into your SAP uh, ERP software. Uh, okay. You know, wherever you want that data, we can pretty much get it there and, and to multiple places. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kalal. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Sure. So, yes, yeah, so back. Uh, I think I was here. Um, yeah, so the, this slide just shows the idea that we're independent of, uh, you know, of hardware manufacturers. Uh, just some uh, background on Copa data. So, we were founded by uh, Thomas Punzenberger uh, in 1987, and uh, Thomas is still the, the CEO. Uh, we're owned by uh, Thomas and his family. So, you know, we're a family-owned uh, independent software company. Uh, worldwide, we have about 300 employees. Uh, in the U.S., there's about 10 of us now in New Jersey. And we do the, uh, the tech support and sales uh, for North America and, and the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, worldwide, Copa Data has, whatever that works out to, roughly $60 million a year in sales. Uh, we've got 5.000 successful customers, or hopefully that's 5,000. Uh, we're... Uh, yeah, 100% family owned, uh, based in Austria. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's our, our biggest office is the Austrian office. And uh, 190,000 systems installed worldwide. That, um, I think that includes both uh, the Zenon, you know, the SCADA platform uh, and our soft PLC. Uh, we've had uh, solid growth. Uh, even in 2020, our business grew, which we're pretty happy about that. Our uh, Probably our energy business and power substation business did not grow, 
but uh, and probably our manufacturing business did not grow and automotive might not have, but uh, food and beverage grew quite a bit and pharmaceutical grew quite a bit in 2020. Uh, just looking at some of the uh, you know, our managers of subsidiaries around the world. Uh, so Ray Giffen's my boss. So Ray runs uh, Copa Data for North America. Uh, you can see that Thomas Punzenberger is still here on the left, CEO and founder. And uh, yeah, and we've got uh, yes, yeah, sub subsidiaries in, for example, India, uh, you know, Germany, Italy, Poland, uh, you know, Central and Eastern Europe, Korea. So you know, quite a bit around the world. Um, in some areas, we don't have a subsidiary, and this line kind of in the middle of the graphic separates those. So if you start looking at like any tech, buyer electronics, and so on, uh, those are uh, exclusive distributors uh, for those countries. So uh, yes, we can definitely support you know, equipment, systems that you build and ship around the world. Uh, we have uh, worldwide support. Uh, just looking at, you know, I'm showing this for Zenon, but this slide, if you pull up the same slide for any SCADA software, these would look somewhat similar. Uh, so SCADA software, uh, the uh, traditional use is your general industrial use. So, you know, a factory, um, you know, uh, some kind of system building things. Uh, but we do uh, very well in energy, uh, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, automotive. And for our customer types, we, um, so we sell a lot to system integrators. So companies that uh, we've uh, trained in how to use the software and they, uh, you know, buy the software and, uh, you know, build control systems with it. Um, end customers buy it. Uh, machine builders, you know, I've already mentioned like Crohn's filling machines, for example. Uh, you know, so they would qualify as a machine builder. So that's a, kind of our breakdown of how, uh, of who we sell the software to. Um, we like these uh, cool little mottos, you know, designed to make your life easier. But it, it really is a, a, a continual thing that goes on with our software. The uh, each new version that comes out, we have more and more uh, object-oriented uh, engineering that goes into it. So it, when you learn to use the software, you don't make, for example, variables. You don't make them one at a time. Can you? Yes. But you can also import them from the PLC. Uh, you can import them from a, you know, from a substation configuration diagram. Uh, you know, there's many ways to import variables. We have an array structure for our variables. So you can create variables uh, in mass. Uh, you can remap all the variables on a screen to a different set of variables uh, very easily. So uh, kind of the goal on all this, we're continually working to make it quicker and easier uh, to put together the, the SCADA system. And of course, reiterating, you know, the basic kind of functions that uh, our kind of software, SCADA software has to do, you know, with your data acquisition, visualization, uh, reporting, which we're very strong in, and uh, making the maintenance of that system easy. Uh, we have great uh, scalability. Uh, you know, our software is solid and robust. Uh, you know, we do a lot of testing related to you know, memory usage and CPU usage. Uh, you know, we've got a security team uh, in Austria that you know monitors. Uh, you know, security functions and, and a lot of it is conformance. So with uh, various uh, security standards, we make sure we conform to them. And uh, 
I love this diagram on the right. Uh, it, it, it's more fun in person, though, to see everybody turn their head to the side to try and read the, uh, <laughs> the text on it. But uh, the universal communication is a key one, in my mind, that we that really connect to nearly every hardware. Uh, and you can see scheduling mentioned here. You know, we've got a built-in production facility and scheduling manager. Uh, you know, which I hadn't mentioned yet. Uh, looking at how we support the software, uh, we've uh, got, of course, our website. Our website has a forum on it. Uh, all of our manuals are on our website. So you can go to copadata.com, go to documentation, and every manual is there. Um, the you know, we do training. Uh, we've got uh, video-based training. So you can do training by watching a series of videos about a particular topic. Uh, you know, I do trainings. I do quite a few. Um, of course, we have a support ticket system, uh, technical experts, and so on. And, yeah, just some screens here showing... Um, you know, some of the clients that we sell to, uh, I'll just mention ones I've dealt with, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, it, it is kind of fun selling software to Microsoft. So <laughs> some, something about that is uh, entertaining, but uh, they, they really push our software. They do some cool stuff with it. Uh, you know, Pfizer with vaccine manufacturing, uh, ABB, uh, they actually relabel it. They call it ABB Zenon. Um, AB InBev, uh, Anheuser-Busch. Um, it, although it's funny, AB InBev, they don't use it a lot in the U.S., uh, although they're looking at it, but they use it pretty much everywhere else in the world. Uh, and we've dealt with them in uh, you know, Mexico and uh, a little bit into South America, too. Um, yeah, I've talked with uh, TI, uh, where they're using it for some stuff. Uh, food and beverage, uh, Crohn's is a big one for us uh, with the filling machines. Uh, Seidel, I've talked with. AB and Bev again. Cintagen, uh, KHS. Uh, you know, some automotive. Uh, a lot of it. A lot of the automotive that we deal with, uh, I think, has been actually sold through Germany. So we end up with uh, BMW and Volkswagen facilities uh, using Zenon quite a bit. And you know, again, pharmaceutical, I mentioned Pfizer um, and Syntogen that I've dealt with. Uh, Harold Holflieger, whoops, I had support questions from them. So. Yeah, so here's some, uh, just some kind of example customers using it. So Novark uh, makes uh, welding robots. So, you know, they run Zenon. Uh, you know, the uh, reporting and trending is important for them. Uh, the uh, Queensland, I guess a region in Australia that uh, uses us uh, for their, uh, you know, part of their uh, power grid there. And uh, they're using our uh, IC61850 and DNP3 uh, energy communication protocols. Uh, and they're using our Zenon Logic, you know, so our soft PLC. Uh, Beer, a beer production plant in Italy. Uh, so we do quite a bit with breweries. Uh, probably, in my mind, it might be because right next to uh, Copa Data World Headquarters in Austria, there's a, a, a beer, monks make beer right there, apparently, the, the way they've been making it for 500 years. So uh, I don't think they use any automation, but uh, uh, with our... Uh, Employees uh, sampling their wares pretty often. They uh, that probably prompted us to get uh, quite a bit into into brewing and, and beer production, and and it's probably because we have a very strong batching system in Zenon. 
including uh, we can create batches uh, in the runtime. So you don't have to you know, break open the editor, the engineering studio to create a batch. It's done by the operator, you know, with correct security authorization in the runtime. Um, yeah, so Audi using it uh, in their painting systems. And here's a graphic just uh, kind of showing some energy uh, usage presented. Um, substation automation is a big area for us. Um, you know, a lot of it based on our uh, good, you know, solid communications with the uh, various energy protocols. Uh, we do, uh, you know, we support interlocking, uh, you know, yeah, and a lot of that's done in, for example, a, a Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, uh, RTAC, Real-Time Automation Controller, uh, they will do this kind of thing where you don't, for example, let a, uh, uh, you know, let a breaker close that would short, you know, a medium voltage system to ground, right? Uh, so that kind of interlocking can be done also in Zenon. And uh, often it's done in both places. So if they have a programming error in the uh, SEL RTAC, at least our software would uh, also work to prevent a, a problem. Um, we have command sequencing. So you can uh, start off a chain of events and uh, that chain of events can have checking at each step. You know, once A is done, do B. Once B is done, do C. But, you know, so we support that kind of thing. Uh, here's just kind of a, a graphic showing a lot of the things that are in our, uh, you know, a lot of our energy features. Uh, you see topological coloring, uh, that's uh, automatic line coloring. So we can uh, use uh, colors of lines to show voltages. And, and that's not done by putting a change color animation on individual line segments. It's actually done with continuity and the lines uh, you know, are assigned their color based on what voltage they're connected to. Uh, trending, alarming, interlocking we talked about. Uh, you can do a full blown simulation within Zenon uh, using our uh, soft PLC functionality, our command sequencing, um, command processing, historian, uh, uh, trending, of course, uh, SQL, you know, looking over here at connectivity, you know, SQL data storage, uh, SAP and other ERP software, uh, cloud storage. Um, this slide is showing some of the uh, the cool uh, object-oriented engineering features of Zenon. So for example, we have a symbol library. Uh, you can add your own symbols to it. Uh, when you drop a symbol into the project, the dialog pops up to remap all the variables. So, you know, that's kind of the bottom level of that kind of function. Uh, we've got um, wizards, so you can... Um, build complete, really complete small projects with our wizards, uh, with a big one being a power substation. Uh, we've got smart objects. So a smart object is a, it's a Zenon project containing you know, variables, functions, screens, uh, soft PLC code. Uh, so you make this smart object and then you can drop it into any project. When you drop it in, a uh, dialog pops up to remap all the variables. You remap them, and now that whole thing is in your project. Uh, and with all these, a, a, a feature that when I first started using it, I thought was pretty cool. If you go into our software, into a project, and rename a variable. Uh, in products I've worked with in the past, 
you just created a big problem because every uh, you know function, screen, everything that referenced that variable, you just broke it. Uh, with Zenon, it's not a problem. You can rename a variable, a screen, and that change just cascades through the whole project. Uh, probably, at least partly because our projects are built on top of a Microsoft SQL database. Yeah, so, you know, that I think makes it easy for us to handle, you know, large numbers of variables you know, in the hundreds of thousands is actually pretty common for people to do. Uh, and small numbers, I mean, it could be 50. Uh, that database though is in the, uh, it's in the development or uh, engineering studio. Uh, you don't have the burden of, a, of that Microsoft SQL database in the runtime. You know, the runtime is leaner. Uh, that database behind the scenes is in the engineering studio. Um, yeah, just looking at how a substation might be configured. Um, you know, you might have, uh, you know, PLCs, uh, other intelligent electronic devices, uh, you know, protection relays, uh, an IC61850 communication bus. Uh, you might have a uh, primary and backup uh, Zen and server, multiple clients, uh, which would be Zenon, or could be uh, HTML5 or uh, 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 web clients. And then, of course, we connect to other systems by you know, DNP3, Modbus, OPC, and so on. Any, any questions at this point? Or? Okay. One thing you might mention, Ron, is um, that you're, you're the software, not the hardware. Yeah, I guess, yeah. You, you know. yeah that, and that is a key idea that we, we don't make any hardware. Uh, you know, Nothing. So uh, we supply the software. We also don't, in general, we don't configure these systems. So uh, you know, we're not the experts on how to make a, a substation function. Uh, we do have some people that know quite a bit, uh, but you know, that we would depend on the integrator for that knowledge. Uh, what our real expertise is is how to configure Zen and how to configure all these communication networks to make everything talk. Um, but then, you know, as far as building and designing a power substation, you know, how thick the wire needs to be, how, how many insulators you need, we don't know. That's not us at all. So, yep, software, not, yep. not hardware. I had a quick question on the... Uh... Sure. Can you create a platform using your software and then private label and say, hey, this is our platform and these are all the devices connected to it, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I guess the only thing would be when you start up the software, it'll say you know, that it's Copa Data Zen and software. Yeah. But, uh, like the, the ABB you mentioned or a, not ABB, is it ABB? Yeah, yeah, ABB. Uh, ABB, they do relabel it. Uh, they call it ABB Zen and so they're not exactly hiding it, I guess. Uh, the, you know, you can protect your intellectual property in the project. You know, you don't, when you supply a system, it's not like they can just go into it and modify it unless you give that to them. But if you don't give them that ability, then they would just have the, uh, the runtime files so they could run it and that would be it. So, you know, in that, in that kind of case, you would still uh, oh. own the, uh, the design, I guess. Um, okay, there it is. But <laughs> usually in systems we see sold, normally they do include the, uh, the development files. Uh, but then usually, if it's, especially if it's anything complicated, the, the customers are usually afraid to make any big changes on their own. You know, they... Yeah, because these can be pretty complicated systems, right? So, uh, what about the number of users that you have? Uh, is there a limitation of, you know, let's say somebody's at a certain factory or whatever, you have to pay 
a license per user that logs in or is how is that done? Yeah, so we, uh, so what we charge, uh, you know, so each of the, like in this diagram here, the, uh, the server pair, so there'd be a price and the price would depend on the, uh, you know, the number of variables, uh, the communication drivers, uh, are you using reporting, uh, things like that. And there'll be a price for the primary server, uh, a lower price for the secondary or backup server. Uh, then it, there's a price for each uh, client, well, I know I have yellow. You know, whether it's a web client or just uh, Zen and running as a client. So we don't charge per user though. So if you have um, you know, license for five web clients, you might have 500 people authorized to use them, but only five at a time would be able to. So, yeah, so we, uh, so we do charge then per, per PC the software runs on and, and per uh, client, you know, whether it's a HTML5 web client or Zen client. And we charge based on number of variables and uh, the drivers that are used. So, you know, as far as what price that leads to, you know, it's really hard to tell. I mean, it could be, you know, for a runtime license, you know, maybe something very small using a, a simple driver like Modbus, you know, maybe it'd be a thousand dollars. Maybe for a power substation with, uh, you know, redundant servers, uh, you know, several clients, uh, using some of the energy protocols, using reporting, uh, maybe it'd be $30,000. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it does depend quite a bit. Uh, and those prices are, I guess it depends what you compare it to, but compared to, to similar software, those prices are pretty good. So wow. hopefully that got what you were after there on the pricing. I'm not sure. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, so just some more examples here. Uh, uh, another one from Queensland, Australia. Uh, another one from Transgrid, Australia. We, it's kind of funny that we, uh, we don't really show U.S. installations, even though we have sold a lot of Zenon for power substations in the U.S., because our customers here don't, don't want that information out. So for security purposes, they prefer we not say which substation is running Zenon, for example. Uh, but a lot of them do run it in the US. Um, yeah, in this example from Australia, they're running uh, IEC 61850 communications and DNP3. Uh, here's one from Greece. Um, I guess this is a 400 and 150 kV uh, you know, air insulated substation. Uh, Vietnam uh, system controlling uh, 30 substations. It's actually kind of a cool picture. So, you know, just looking at the picture here, you can tell it's just. Well, you're really just seeing the monitors. Uh, um, I'm not sure if it's a standard PC like or, good and then, but yeah, they might be a hardened, uh, no, you know, redundant one. power supply uh, type PC, yeah, you know, from uh, no. yeah, some like GE or SEL. Uh, yeah, energy distribution uh, from Sweden. I know. And here's a system with uh, yeah. you know one line diagram, uh, you know, with uh, automatic line coloring in it. Uh, we do quite a bit with, uh, you know, offshore, uh, wind farm stuff, uh, mainly Europe, as far as I know, with that kind of system. Uh, but, you know, offshore, the, you know, inverters, you know, you want most uh, of I guess regulators going from AC like to DC, uh, you know, connecting to the transmission one, grid to SCADA and so on. Like you know, like um, 
Yeah, here's another offshore one from Germany. Uh, looks like this one they're using a back net. I was surprised. I thought it would be nice. That's probably for uh, climate control, you know, HVAC within yeah, the facility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then it's using uh, 6870 yeah, for uh, the energy network. Uh, something from Switzerland, uh, 15,000 households on that system. Um, another one from uh, from uh, Austria here uh, goes up to 110 kV. Yeah, I've been working today. Hopefully, I got so, a reply. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you one second, Ron, mute everybody, and then we got somebody on that keeps coming in our background. Then go ahead and unmute again. Okay. Uh, Okay, now I'm unmuted, hopefully. Yeah, you're unmuted again. I, I, I went ahead and blocked it. We we're getting a lot of background noise from someone. Yeah, might, uh, yeah, it could be something here too. My my wife is working at home today doing uh, purchasing for a hospital chain. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, it, no problem. Yeah, I told her she's not allowed to order any organs when I'm on a call, but other <laughs> stuff she is. <laughs> uh, Yes, yeah, so here, uh, system from Germany, uh, you know, we got somebody to switch over from the Siemens uh, SICAM uh, system over to uh, Zenon. Um, you know, scalability is big with our software, you know, ranging from, you know, a little system with a small touchscreen up through, uh, you know, fully redundant multiple servers, uh, you know, multiple or many clients, for example. Um, we've also got our process recorder. So this lets us essentially record data and then play it back later. So you can, you know, follow through and see, uh, see what happened in the system, for example. Um, and, you know, this is showing the, the replay mode that we have. Um, this, this screen is showing our, uh, just some of the energy communication protocols that we use. Yes, our 61850 being oh, a big one, uh, um, DNP3, Modbus, um, open charge point protocol for, uh, for vehicles. And then over on the right, kind of some more common industrial uh, standards, you know, like Siemens Ethernet, you know, yeah. Beckhoff, uh, AB, uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> and more than uh, 300 communication protocols. Uh, looking here in the uh, cybersecurity area, uh, we've got a, a security team in Austria, I think I mentioned, and they, they do a lot with helping us, uh, for example, bidding. If we're putting in a bid and the spec is calling out security standards, you know, they help us figure out uh, which ones we meet or, or don't meet. Um, this IEC 62443-4-1, uh, that, that ensures that our development environment is secure against uh, you know, somebody inserting malicious code into the software. Um, a, a really nice area is our support for Active Directory and RADIUS. So I think RADIUS, I don't know anything about RADIUS. I think it's more Linux-based. Uh, Active Directory would be the Microsoft one. But uh, you don't have to run your security, your usernames and passwords and authorizations. You don't have to run them from within Zen. They can be run by your IT group. And we link into that Active Directory container. And so when IT crosses off somebody's account, they're instantly no longer authorized uh, in Zenon either. So that, that I think is a nice uh, security feature we have. Uh, then of course, encryption on uh, a lot of the protocols. Well, not a lot, on some of them. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the overview. So it, yeah, any questions before I jump into to showing the software a little bit here? Okay. So let me uh, pull that up here. So, uh, so this is a demo project, uh, and this is the runtime for our Zenon software. Uh, 
here is the uh, uh, what we call the engineering studio or editor for the project. So this is where it's created. I've got a number of projects sitting here. Uh, the active one right now is our uh, standard demo project. Um, so going back over here to the runtime or what we call the service engine. Um, yes, yeah, so I can click on any of these categories and, and take a look at some things we do. So in energy, for example, um, here's a kind of cool graphic showing uh, you know, pump storage. So we're pumping water uh, up into a lake, uh, probably at night when the electricity is less expensive. In the daytime, it runs back down uh, through the uh, turbine you know, to generate power. Um, of course, we have an alarming here. I can double click and acknowledge. Um, we've, uh, and click here and take a look at a one line diagram uh, for substations. Um, notice we support right clicking to turn things on and off. So here, the way this has been configured uh, to, to open this Q1, uh, what is that, a disconnect, I guess. If I right click it, I can open it uh, or close it. And uh, then uh, you know, open or close uh, breakers. And uh, the line coloring works off that. So if I open that one and open that one, uh, well, I'm not sure. I kind of thought that red would change color, but it, everything below it, oh yeah, I guess it is. It's, the voltage is coming uh, downward, apparently. So, uh, you yeah, know, so everything below it changed from uh, red to, uh, to gray, indicating it's not energized. If I close it, yeah, now these uh, re-energized. Uh, maybe I need to close that. Now those energized and so on. So, uh, yes, yeah, so automatic line coloring, fully supported. Uh, look here on the wind farm. Uh, now this is uh, showing a GIS integration, so map integration with Zenon. Um, you, know, you just uh, put in the GPS coordinates of, of uh, the equipment. I can click on any of these and uh, you know, tell me you know, Turbine 2 uh, has wind, I guess, coming from the north, uh, 13 meters per second and so on. And if I and I can zoom in or out here, and uh, then I can use these to navigate. Uh, I think you know visually that's kind of a nice feature that we have. Uh, so load management. So we've got a, a you know separate module in our software to support uh, managing a load including uh, shedding load if needed, things like that. Um, I think I can go to devices here. And I think if I turn, uh, okay, if I turn some things on here, whoops, double clicked it. So there's a delay because when I turn them on, then what's happening, that's writing to our, uh, our soft PLC building is running the simulation here. And as I turn these on, our load should become too high. And uh, if I close that, so you can see our load now is above the supply limit and uh, some things in the software will automatically start uh, re shedding some of that load. So some of those devices I turned on are getting turned off now until it gets below 2,000, uh, whatever that is, I don't know, kilowatts or megawatts or something. Um, yeah, so the load now has dropped down below 2,000. Um, alarming. Uh, you know, double clicking to acknowledge. Uh, we've got some cool alarm filtering. So let's say I'm only interested in certain alarms. I can click filter and 
I can filter, let's say, by uh, variable names. So let's only show alarms that have uh, 13 in them, because I see a couple at the top are 13. So now we're only getting alarms from uh, Energy Wind Farm 13. Uh, so you see this throughout Zen, and we've got really nice filtering on our alarming on our chronological event list. You know, it's very easy, you know, in a big system with hundreds of thousands of variables, uh, it's pretty easy to get down, uh, to narrow things down to the data that you want. Uh, we can also filter by alarm groups, alarm areas, and alarm classes. So I turned it off, so they're all up here now. Um, Yeah, so that's our alarming. Then a quick look over at the fruit and beverage. Uh, so similar to our automatic line coloring, we've got a similar function uh, for processes. So here the piping is getting colored uh, to indicate, looking at the legend here, green indicates operating. Our uh, uh, logic program that's running is kind of randomly uh, stopping some of the equipment to uh, yes, and then we can see the, the color changes. Um, we've got uh, yeah, availability, performance, uh, figures being tracked, uh, machine status, basically alarming. Here's our uh, batching. Uh, so here's where uh, batches would be set up, uh, recipes, trending, uh, you know, of course, you can zoom in, zoom out, uh, uh, turn a cursor on or off. Uh, we've got a Gantt chart trending up at the top. You know, uh, so the, the green, you know, in, would indicate like, uh, you know, overall equipment efficiency, for example. I can turn, like, turn off some of these. Uh, you can check here. Yeah, so it's pretty easy to, uh, to narrow the trend down to, to the data that you want to see. Uh, of course, cursor. Yes, you can drag a cursor. Yes, see values at the time of the, you know, at the cursor uh, position. And reporting. Um, so the reports shown here are, this is the basic reporting. This is not even the advanced reporting. Uh, but here we've got um, an alarm report, uh, overall equipment efficiency report. And notice these reports can be uh, exported to, to Excel, to XLS or uh, PDF. And uh, you know, that export can happen manually or automatically. Uh, we can do filtering uh, on a report. You know, to show batches from a certain time. Uh, we can look at uh, a consumption report. So, yeah, so some reporting here shown in the food and beverage. Uh, looking at the automotive part of the demo, uh, we, we can zoom out here. Uh, I think this is pretty cool. If I zoom in, when I zoom in far enough, we start to get more detail. So we've got... Um, I forget what this is called, but context sensitive zoom or something like that. But, uh, you know, we can zoom in. I can click on any of these devices and see what's happening. So these are, this is some sort of conveyor moving cars, you know, through an assembly facility. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I can see what has happened at each of the cells. I can navigate here also to different parts of the facility or I can uh, zoom back out. You know, so I can navigate uh, either way. Um, and if I want to identify a station, if I double click it, it kind of lights up. Um, here we can monitor the, uh, our soft PLC, what it's doing. And it's uh, randomly right, turning some stuff on and off. To, create some motion on the screen. But, uh, you know, these are, you know, this is just 
PLC code. So uh, looks like a sequential function chart code. And um, yeah, and then uh, looking here at the uh, the batching, uh, yes, we can see uh, some batches uh, running here. Um, if we look at batch control, yes, this could be pharmaceutical, probably pharmaceutical type batching, uh, you know, with various materials being added, a heat exchanger, so something being heated probably or cooled, valves, um, the recipe group manager, uh, we have an audit trail built in. So this is our, um, basically our, I guess this is the alarming. So basically alarming or chronological event list. Um, and again, the report viewer, uh, you know, similar to the other reports that we saw. Uh, here, if I, you know, so you can drag these menus in and out. Um, here, I'll just click a button to log in the administrator, for example. Um, you can drag, drag other ones out. You know, let's switch everything to uh, know, Korean or something. Um, so, in uh, now, right now, in this project was mainly made for Zenon version eight point twenty. In Zenon version ten, alarm information is also able to be translated, but in this project made for version eight, uh, the alarm information is not translated. But if I, uh, you know, like go right now to, I don't know, my power substation. Um, I actually, I guess some of the, yeah, the alarm comments aren't being translated, but they could be. Uh, yeah, and then I can put it back uh, to English here. So, you know, definitely if you are uh, building machines and shipping them around the world, uh, that is pretty handy. Uh, the translation, it's not automatic. You, ha you have to actually load in a, a table, either manually key them in or, or from CSV, load in a table of, you know, English, German, Chinese, Spanish, you know, translations. Um, Yes, any, any questions on the, you know, I've kind of flown through the whole demo project here. I don't, any questions or anything, any screens you'd like me to, to pop up on here? Hey, Ron, this is Bruce. I have a question. Sure, Bruce. Um, the, the demos actually are pretty robust, so I, I like the, I like what you've shown here. However, when I, I look at them and I heard what you said about pricing, what is, if you took one of these installations we used as an example or you showed us, what is the implementation time or transition to your software from either not being centralized before or conversion from somebody else? How much time does it take to program this at all the different point sensors that are may or may not already exist. Is, is it a big process? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to give a clear answer to that, but, but things that we have that make it easier uh, so we can import variables, for example, from, uh, from PLCs, we can connect to PLCs, import variables. We can, uh, with maybe a Siemens or a Rockwell PLC, uh, we can import variables from your, your PLC project. Like with Siemens, I worked on that recently. Uh, we can pull them in from the, the TIA software, so like a TIA 16, 15, 14. Uh, so that saves a lot of time. So the variable, you know, if you're starting with a, a PLC that does symbolic addressing and things like that, the variable creation should be quick, even if it's a lot of variables. Um, the, you know, another idea will be making the screens. Well, if it's, for example, 
something repetitive. Like let's say it's a tank farm. You have 50 tanks. Um, with Zenon, you only make one screen or two. So you probably make an overall screen showing a summary of the whole facility. Then you'll make a second screen showing tank one. Uh, then you make a function to remap everything on tank one screen to any other tank. So you wouldn't need 50 screens for 50 tanks. You need one screen for one tank and we remap all the variables. Now, if it's not repetitive, if you have you know, 50 different things you need to look at in detail and they're all different where they can't be reused, you know, I guess then you'd have to make 50 separate screens. So which, you know, would take 50 times as long as making one screen, right? So it, it's hard to say, but the um, we've done kind of a maximum effort in making things uh, reusable, you know, with our symbol library, uh, with our uh, uh, screen switch function that, that lets you remap variables. So I guess the answer is... Sorry, no, I, I knew it was a loaded question when I gave it to you because size and scale, you know, obviously have such a big variable. Is it safe to say that, you know, when you were talking about the number of users and the other pricing and licensing that a transition or implementation would be priced separately than your standard user kind of costs? Well, we, we wouldn't, we normally would not do the, you know, let's say you're using, you know, Wonderware. Normally, we would not do the conversion. You would have to convert it or your system integrate. Got uh, it. Okay. Now I understand. Uh, That's all I needed to know. I, th I thought it was something you would provide. No. And, and the key, you know, from what I've seen, the key th question there isn't how long it takes. The key question is, can you find the guy that programmed the PLCs? Yeah, because if the if the the company or team that did all your PLC programming is gone, I mean, have right. fun, you know. I mean, maybe they left great documentation. Okay, now you're okay. But if they're gone and left no documentation, uh, you know, that gets fun. <laughs> so it, you know, it, but it's definitely an issue, right? The and and realistically, like if somebody has a current SCADA system and it's working fine and it's doing what they need, they're not gonna switch. Why would they switch? It, it's fine. Uh, but where it's an issue is when they have a system that it's been good, but now it's 15 years old, we've added, you know, we've doubled the size of our facility. Half our facility isn't even in the system. You know, now, at that point, they have no choice. They've got to uh, put in a new system. So first they make the decision, hey, we've got a, you know, half the facility running on this 15-year-old Wonderware. We've got you know, some Rockwell stuff over here, Siemens stuff over here. Um, we want to put our whole facility onto a good SCADA platform. So that decision gets made. Then... Uh, you know, maybe they put out, you know, an RFP or something. Uh, and, you know, Zenon is competitive. Pricing-wise, we're competitive. And compared to other people with our, uh, you know, with these advanced tools we have for, uh, you know, for reusing objects, for smart projects, symbol library, you know, we put together a project very efficiently and quickly. Uh, but the big barrier is always knowing what the system does. You know, d does the integrator have that knowledge of how the system works? And if they have that knowledge, uh, then it'll go together, you know, pretty quickly. If they don't have the knowledge, it, it's tough, you know. So, yeah, I wish I had a clear answer to All it, right. but you know how it goes. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you helped me out. Thank you. Oh, sure. And uh, yeah, well, any, uh, and you know, just one thing to say too, you can go to copadata.com and download Zenon. Uh, go to the web, Copadata, register, uh, then you can download the software. 
Uh, because the development tool includes Microsoft SQL, uh, it's big. It's uh, about eight gig. The, now the runtime is much smaller. The runtime is lean, but the uh, development or engineering studio is eight gig. So you can download it from our website in that free mode. It'll run, I think for 30 minutes at a time for 30 days. You know, so you, so you can play with it quite a bit in that free mode. Um, yeah, so feel free to do that. Um, and yeah, and then I was just going to pop up my, uh, contact info here. So, uh, yeah, you can always, uh, you know, contact I've got, I've me. I've got to leave because i got another meeting. Nice meeting. Okay. You. Okay. Thank you, Amre. Thank you, Amre. All right. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, so you guys can feel free to contact me. You know, you know, Roger Fritz has been uh, playing with the software some too, and he, you know, Roger's pretty interested in it for some projects, uh, you know, both for him and uh, it, yeah, I think uh, Brandon, his son, is uh, looking at using it too. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, let me know if you need anything on, on Zenon or have any questions uh, uh, or want training. You know, I also do uh, training on the software and, and other people in our office do too. So, uh, yeah, so that's about all I've got. I, you know, thanks a lot for your time. I sure appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, taking an uh, hour and a half or two hours to, to look at our SCADA software. And, uh, yeah, thanks to Roger for uh, hosting all this. I you know, appreciate uh, getting to tell people about it. Oh, you're very welcome, Ron. And I appreciate everybody taking their time, too. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, please reach out to either one of us, and we'll, we'll try to answer the questions for you. So. Okay. Well, hey, thanks a lot, everybody. And I guess, uh, guess we're uh, wrapping it up here then. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot, and everybody have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Ron. Yep, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you both.